Hello, this is Jerry Morton. Welcome to my Finding My Way podcast. This is podcast number 42, titled Here to There. Podcasts 34 through 61 are stories from the year of Army training I experienced. The training started in August 1966 and ended in June 1967. The stories are published in the book Reluctant Lieutenant from Basic to OCS in the 60s, which was published by Texas A&M University Press as a military history. Here to There is an account of Jerry's train trip from Fort Dix, New Jersey to Fort McClellan, Alabama in October 1966 where he will begin Advanced Infantry Training, AIT. Jerry is suddenly in a leadership position, and then he's not. Here to there. Less than a third of the men in our platoon were left to spend the night in the barracks. Hawk and I were among the lucky few. The barracks seemed barren and strange. Most of the bunks had been stripped of their bedding and mattresses rolled back. Sounds echoed in the huge room. There was trash scattered on the floor. Even the overhead lighting seemed harsh. There had been so much intensity in this place. It seemed as if every corner had a memory attached to it. I felt lonely in my space. It no longer belonged to me, yet I seemed to belong to it. I was still here. Hawk said that we ought to stay up all night and spit shine the floor. Why would we want to do that, I asked in disbelief. He seemed to be serious about it. When the new recruits come in and see the way the floor shines, they'll say, who do you reckon did this? They'll figure that the guys before them took pride in what they did and try to live up to the standard we set, Hawk said with conviction. I thought about it for a moment. Ah, the idea appealed to me. Besides, it would make Hawk happy. There was nothing else to do except finish stuffing things in our duffel bags. In the morning, we would eat say goodbye, and catch our separate trains. Why not spend the night creating a mystery? I agreed. Hawk convinced two other guys to join us. Stuffing the duffel bags was a complicated process. It took at least two guys, and sometimes three, to get it done. Folding or rolling your shirts and pants to fit the space was the first step. After the bag was about a third full, you stood inside it to compress the clothes even more. Your partners held you in the sides of the bag up. Without them, you would constantly be falling over. With help, you only fell over a couple of times. The process would be continuously repeated until all of your belongings were inside the bag. It was absolutely astonishing how much you can get into a duffel bag. Just when you were certain that you could not put one more thing into it, one of your partners would find a soft spot on the side of the bag. A soft spot meant that some of your clothes, shoes, or other items had not completely compressed. This meant that there was more space in the bag. Sadly, The soft spots always seemed to be deep down inside. Unpacking and then repacking the bag more than three or four times tended to try the patience of many. If you took more time than that, you would surely hear curses and shouts and see infantrymen about to cry. The process was humbling. Despite the frustration, no matter how much you put into your duffel bag, there was always room for one more thing. 
I never saw anyone leave something behind because it would not fit in his duffel bag. We started on the floors at about eight in the evening. It was fun. We told jokes. We laughed over the funny things we had witnessed during basic. The time went pretty fast until it got on toward midnight. Clear shoe polish, water, and cotton balls were our tools. First you got a cotton ball and rubbed it in the shoe polish. Next you covered about a half a square foot area with the wax. Then you polished it up and covered it with a lighter coat of wax. You next dip a cotton ball in water, the water you put in the lid of the shoe polish can, and use it to polish the wax into a reflective shine that enables you to begin to see your reflection in it. Another light coat of wax and further rubbing with the wet cotton ball brings it to an even higher level of glossiness. If there is any hint of a dim spot in the shiny area, you repeat the process. By midnight, we had a third of the platoon bay sparkling so brightly, you might think it was covered with a thin layer of ice. This was going to be a long night. We still had two-thirds of the floor to go. The fingers on my right hand were starting to cramp. I had to stop and straighten them out with my other hand. The same thing was happening to the other guys. Even if we kept up this pace, I doubted that we could get it all done before we had to leave in the morning. As 1 a.m. rolled in and out, our conversation was less frequent. We kept at it. Every so often, someone's arm would slip. Smack! They would hit the floor. It was worth a few laughs. Some of the squares of the linoleum that I was working on were getting smeared because I was not keeping my cotton balls wet enough. By two, we were getting giddy. Our jokes were not making sense, so they were pretty funny. I kept falling. My arms were not holding my face up. When we moved furniture, we would forget and move it over just shined areas and scratch up the shine. That area had to be done over. No one complained. We just kept on. By 2.30, it was clear to me that we were starting to make a mess. I had made a mistake. I could not keep this up. I needed sleep. Hawk, we're not going to make it, I said with resignation. Yes, we are. You just may have to... You just have to work faster. Hawk, we're just making too many mistakes. We're too tired. I'm not tired. I can keep going. What about you guys? He asked, looking at the other two. We can keep going if you can, Hawk. They agreed. Okay, but I can't. I'm sorry, guys, but I've got to go to sleep. I'm going to have to go to bed. Well, I said that with sadness, but resolve in my voice. It's okay, Jerry. Hawk was kind. Yeah, the other two agreed. I hated to let them down. I had said that I would stay up all night and help. I admitted at the time, but I was wrong. This was stupid. It would never get done. We were making things worse at this point. They could not see it. I was making my area worse. I should have had enough sense to know that I could not stay up all night doing this. I'm just sorry, guys. I just have to get some sleep. And I just slowly got up. It's okay, Hawk repeated softly. Not bothering to take my clothes off, I climbed into my bunk. They kept working. Their muffled voices soothed me into sleep. 
Why are these lights on? demanded a loud commanding voice. What are you men doing here? It was the duty officer. Hawk and the other two guys sprang to attention. I rolled over to get a view of the officer while pretending to be asleep. Hawk responded with a mixture of surprise and pride in his voice. Spit shining the floor, sir. This is ludicrous. Who ordered you to do this? I could see the officer was wearing the silver bar of a first lieutenant. No one ordered us to do it, sir. Hawk responded, We just wanted to do it. Well, I want you to stop. This isn't right. Turn out the lights and go to bed now. Yes, sir, the three of them responded in unison. The officer left. Hawk turned off the lights. They went to bed without saying another word. After breakfast, the word came down that everyone going to Fort McClellan was to form up out front by the trucks. It took real skill to hoist the duffel bag onto your shoulder. The shoulder strap made it a little easier to carry. No matter how you did it, the damn thing was hard to manage. Some of the smaller guys just dragged it out. There were about, hmm, I don't know, 200 men lined up beside the long line of deuce and a half trucks. Most of them were not from our company. I do not know where they came from, but they were here. No one from my platoon that I knew was going to Fort McClellan. Three sergeants had set up a folding table near the trucks. They started yelling out names from a long list. Like everyone else, when my name was called, I responded, Here, Sergeant. After identifying yourself, you went to the table and picked up your personnel file. Then you returned to the ranks. We were told not to open our personnel files. When we arrived at Fort McClellan, someone would take them. The confidential files were inside large manila envelopes. The metal clasp had been fastened to keep the envelopes shut, but the flaps' glue seals had not been dampened. They were not sealed. As the seated sergeant handed me my personnel file, he said, Morton, you're in charge of getting every man on the train to Fort McClellan. Here's the roster of the men on your train. He handed me a long list of names as my mouth fell open. How do I do that, I asked in disbelief. That's your problem, isn't it? The trucks will load up and leave for the train station in about 15 minutes. Well, they're in formation. You'd better tell them your plan. Once they get on the trucks... It will be harder to communicate. That's all. He motioned for me to move on as there were several guys standing behind me waiting to get their personnel files. I walked toward the formation, my mind racing. There were 12 trucks. About 20 guys could fit on a packed truck. Most people had a friend or an acquaintance with whom they had chosen to stand with in the ranks. That had been my intention. I had seen several men that I knew. I had stood in line together with them while waiting to participate in some kind of a drill, test, or training exercise during basic. Some of them had level heads. Others tended to hack people off or foul up in some way. By the time I had covered the 30 paces back to the formation, I had a plan. While the men were in formation, they were at ease. They were not at attention. Everyone was talking to everyone else. I picked out 12 guys I thought were okay. We huddled together in front of the formation. They've put me in charge of getting everyone to Fort McClellan, I said. I need your help keeping track of people. Everyone agreed to help. I explained the plan. 
Each man was to have a buddy. He was to select his own buddy. No one was to go anywhere on or off the train without his buddy. The twelve guys I had selected would each be responsible for a truckload of men. There would be roughly twenty men on each truck or ten buddy teams. Each of the truck leaders was to be in charge of that group for the whole trip. They were to keep track of the ten or so buddy teams that boarded their truck until we arrived at Fort McClellan. Since the train trip was to take about a day and a half, there would be unexpected stops, layovers, and other problems. We would get a head count after every stop. The trip ticket the sergeant had given me, along with the roster of names, said that we would have a four-hour layover in Atlanta. We would also be changing trains there. That would be just one of many headaches which we would have to deal with. We would need to keep meeting as a group to anticipate and deal with problems. Since I had never done anything like this before, I assured them that I did not know what I was doing. We would have to work together in order to pull this off successfully. One of the buddy team leaders asked if they could pick the guys who got on their trucks. I said it was fine with me, but told them I did not think they would have time to pull it off. I said I did not want anyone trying to prevent a buddy team from getting on their truck just because they did not know the guys personally. They agreed to adopt my basic plan. I did not want to call the whole formation to attention and give them a series of instructions as if I were a lieutenant or a sergeant. I was a private, just as they were. During basic training, the sergeant selected various people to take turns as acting squad leaders. I had never been selected to hold a leadership position. They gave the acting squad leaders buck sergeant stripes to pin on their sleeves to signify their leadership role. On this trip, I had nothing but the responsibility. I had no authority. There were no stripes to wear on my arm. I would surely catch hell if we lost half of the men on the trip. I decided to use the rumor mill to get the word out on what people were supposed to do on the trip. We had about five minutes to go before the sergeants announced that we were to load up. I directed the 12 truck leaders to go back to the ranks and tell as many men as they could that they would have to pick a buddy and stay with that buddy for the whole trip. They would have to have a buddy to get on the trucks. Maybe everyone would get the word, except the 10 percenters. There were always the 10 percent who never got the word. Once the men had boarded the trucks, each truck leader would let his group know that he would be responsible for keeping track of their buddy teams for the whole trip. I instructed them to make a list of the names of the men in their truck for accountability purposes and to advise the men in their group that they would have to get approval from them to leave the train at any time. I added that requests for anything unusual should be cleared through me. That would give us all some time to figure out how to deal with any unexpected situations. It worked! Within the five-minute interval, all 200 or so men got the word. By the time the trucks arrived at the train station, everything was in order. No one objected. I was amazed. The organizational structure handled the loading of duffel bags and men without a hitch. I had learned the effectiveness of the buddy system while pulling lifeguard duty as a counselor at a Boy Scout summer camp outside of Kenosha, Wisconsin, Camp O Dakota, during my high school years. 
It was easy to lose track of one of the kids in the water, but the likelihood of losing two at the same time was just about zero. If a buddy team got separated, it showed up immediately when they were checking out of the water. We would know who was missing immediately and begin calling out the kid's name. The missing person was quickly found. Oh, if the kid was not found, we had to assume he had drowned. That meant a massive search for the body and then applying artificial recitation until some camp official declared the victim to be alive or dead. We never lost anyone during my stay at the camp. To my surprise, there were a lot of civilians on the train. It was not just a troop train. The soldiers sat anywhere they wanted to as long as they were with their buddy and their team leader knew where they were. This seemed to be natural enough. The fact that their buddy was a chosen companion was a big plus. Since most of them knew and liked their team leader, the whole process worked well. People were staying together by choice rather than because of orders. Once we were aboard the train, we settled into a routine. It was clear that almost everyone was opening her personnel file. The middle class were all that kept the envelopes shut. There was no way the Army would know if they had been opened since you did not have to tear the envelope to open it. You just pulled up the two wings of the metal clasp, and it was open. Curiosity got the better of me. After all, I reasoned, everyone else was looking. The scores from the battery of tests that we took during the first week were recorded in it, as were our rifle qualification and proficiency test scores. Background information was also there. Education, age, religion and other identifying items. What I found most interesting was Sergeant Boone's comments about me. One section of a set of forms included a written evaluation of the soldier's performance and basic training by the platoon sergeant. Boone had written of me in that section, seemed disoriented at the beginning of basic, did not interact as a team member often. By middle of basic, became oriented to the program. Was a strong contributor to the progress of the group from then on. Was considered to be a leader. I did not agree with the first part of his evaluation. I liked the way it ended. The frequent short stops at little stations along our route began to pose a problem. The team leaders were reporting that the men wanted to get off the train so they could stretch. Okay, I said, as long as they get off with their buddy and stay within sight of the train so they know when it's ready to leave. I figured that they were going to do whatever they wanted to do and that it was best not to be too rigid. This way, when the conductors called out, Board! We would know who needed to get back on and could still see them at all times. It worked. I worried about the longer stops. Those tended to last just long enough for someone to go inside the terminal, walk around a while, and then be out of earshot of the conductor's call to board the train. We took a head count using the buddy system after each stop. Everyone was present. Atlanta was tough. We had that blasted for our layover. I saw no point in trying to restrict anyone from going anywhere. They were going to go where they wanted to, no matter what we said. Rather than create a big conflict, I thought we should let the men exercise their own good judgment. They knew the consequences of missing the train as well as I did. The only rule I imposed was that they had to have their buddy with them. 
We took a hit count minutes before the train was to pull out of the station. One man was missing. His team leader was in a panic. What shall we do? he asked. Was his buddy with him? They started out together, he explained. The missing man is from Atlanta. He, he wanted to see a girlfriend. The buddy was afraid they would miss a train, so they decided to separate. The buddy came back to the train and said his friend told him he would be back on time. Well, there's nothing for us to do. If he misses a train, we'll simply report it to the Fort McClellan people. It's not our fault. Try not to worry about it, I had told him. The poor guy was really stressed out. He was taking this responsibility thing a little too seriously. If anyone got into trouble, it would be me, not him. Since leaving Fort Dix, I had given serious thought to this whole situation. Any responsibility I had on this trip was an illusion. All I really had to do was to tell someone at Fort McClellan we had gotten on the train at Fort Dix and who had got off at Fort McClellan. We had no control over anyone. The guys could do whatever they pleased. It was surprising to me that they had done everything we had asked of them. This just proved, as far as I was concerned, what a responsible bunch of men these soldiers were. We had not had one unpleasant incident on the train. Everyone got along well together. We were in the same boat. No one wanted to make trouble for anyone else. We were all just trying to get through this experience and get on with our lives. Part of me wondered why I had been selected to bear the responsibility for getting everyone to Fort McClellan. The sergeants had never selected me to serve as an acting squad leader. Sergeant Boone's assessment of me did not appear to mark me for an assignment like this. I could not figure out their rationale for putting me in charge. Just as the train started to roll slowly forward, our missing man came running through the station doors and jumped aboard. It was a relief to see him. No one on the train knew anything about Fort McClellan. We just assumed that it would be a copy of Fort Dix. Fort McClellan, next stop, announced the porter. Good luck, men, he said with a nod and a smile. Several of the guys shook hands with the porters. We had shared a long trip together. New friendships had been formed. All of the civilians who had gotten on and off the train were kind to us. Outside of having to sleep in a sitting position during the night and having to eat sandwiches sold by vendors on the train or at the stations, the trip had been pleasant. Sergeants were waiting at us as the train pulled us alongside the platform. Form up, people. Form up. Column of four. Let's go. Form up. Form up. Columns of four, came the shouted orders as we disembarked. Trucks were waiting for us in front of the station. I approached the sergeant with the most stripes on his sleeves. Sergeant, here's the roster of the men on the train, I said, handing him the list of names. How many men are missing? He queried, looking over my shoulder at the men forming up behind me. None, Sergeant, I replied. They're all here. Okay, he said, taking the sheet of paper. Go ahead and fall in with the others. I did as I was told.